Hey guys, I'm Tom the Tech Chap, and by now you've probably seen and read a whole bunch of PS5 reviews. But I've waited just a little bit longer as I wanted to test more games, get a feel for how it stacks up against the Xbox Series X, and also maybe I got a little bit distracted by Black Ops. But let me start by saying I love this thing, I really do. Even if there aren't that many next-gen games to play, the games themselves can be eye-wateringly expensive, and I do wish we had more storage. There's actually only 667 gigs usable. But the new controller, with the absolutely incredible haptics and force feedback triggers, gaming at 4K60 or even 120 FPS, ray tracing effects for extra shiny and realistic reflections, super fast load times thanks to the new SSD, incredible backwards compatibility where the extra horsepower of the PS5 can boost performance, speed up load times, and like the Series X, genuinely make you want to replay all your old favorites. I mean, take Ghost of Tsushima, it's now 60 FPS on the PS5, up from 30 on the PS4 Pro. And with games like Fortnite and No Man's Sky having updates so they play at 4K60, have better graphics and even a higher multiplayer count, even just your bulk standard PS4 games that haven't had any updates or optimizations at all, simply play better on PS5. So there is genuinely a lot to get excited about, but we also have to be careful not to get too wrapped up in all the hype. Although, having said that, I must admit, when a new console does finally launch, I mean, last time we had, what, the PS4 was about seven years ago, the PS4 Pro was a bit of a mid-upgrade about three, three and a half years ago, a whole new console generation is a pretty big deal. And the thing is, I already have a pretty capable gaming PC, and I've had an SSD and ray tracing options for years now, but there's still something a little bit magical about a new console, and it also starts to raise the lowest common denominator for the hardware that games are developed for. So in time, it ends up benefiting everyone, console and PC gamers. And I think also knowing that all my friends can enjoy these sort of next-gen upgrades uh, and only have to spend, you know, £450 or so on a PS5 or Xbox Series X and not a couple of grand on a gaming PC is pretty cool and it is just simply a lot of fun. And I think we can all agree this year uh, we all need a bit more fun. Now before I get to the practical part of the video saying, you know, there's not many next-gen experiences and why you should wait a while for more games to come out, let me start by showing you the fun stuff. And if we kick off with Spider-Man, I mean, swinging around New York as Miles Morales on the PS5 is genuinely an open mouth wow moment. The graphics, the smoothness of the frame rate, even just how comfortable the new controller is to hold. It's an awesome experience. And of course, it's also one of the best showcases of ray tracing on a console. So in Spider-Man, you have performance and fidelity modes, with the latter capping the frame rate to 30 FPS, but giving us fancier graphics, including RT, which as you can see, makes a pretty big difference to how realistic the reflections are. Shiny floors, windows, puddles, it does look good. But then once you've gawped at it and turned it off and on a few times to see the difference, chances are, like me, you'll stick with performance mode, which gives you the much smoother 60 FPS which I'm sure you'll agree is a lot more useful in a game like this than having fancy reflections. So I think Spider-Man was my first sort of like next-gen wow moment, uh, but then the second one came when I fired up a bit of Black Ops. Actually, no, let me back up a second, because in Astro's Playroom, which you've no doubt seen or maybe even played already, but it's a fantastic tech demo of the new DualSense controller. You can really feel the nuance of the haptics, firing the jetpack with the triggers, or moving it around and feeling the weight inside shift about, thanks to what is basically next-gen rumble. So definitely give Astro's Playroom a try when you get your PS5. But back to Call of Duty, and when I pressed R2 to fire a gun for the first time, something you do quite a lot in COD, I had another genuine wow moment. So every game is different, and it's up to the developers how and if they use the adaptive triggers, but in Call of Duty, it has a whole new level of tactileness, or tactility, whatever the word is. To feel some real weight in the trigger when you fire off an AK is such a cool experience. Now, you may absolutely hate it, and it probably doesn't do you any favors in competitive multiplayer, so you can turn it off, but personally, I love it, and honestly, I think it's a bigger deal, or at least more immersive than, say, shiny ray tracing effects. NBA 2K21 also uses the trigger, so you can now more precisely chuck the ball. I think that's the correct term. And not only that, but as well as the new USB-C charging port, the usual swipey touchpad, which I've always found to be a bit gimmicky, we have built-in mic and speakers. So when I was playing Black Ops Online, I could talk and hear my teammates through the controller. What's the sound quality like for me? Can you hear me pretty well? Um, I mean, it kind of, it's breaking up a little bit, but it's not, it's not that bad. All right, cool, thank you. 
So while the new Xbox controller is pretty much the same as before, aside from a textured back, USB-C and a new share button, the DualSense PS5 controller is a real upgrade. The battery doesn't last as long as the Xbox controller though, I've been playing it a fair bit, uh, but so far I've had to charge it every couple of days or so. Sticking with Black Ops for a minute, which does look incredible by the way, in the graphics settings you'll see that we also get ray tracing support, although I've tried my best to notice the difference on and off and it's extremely subtle. The bigger deal here is the support for up to 120 FPS. It's a little bit strange that you actually have to go to the PS5 settings and manually change this option to performance mode, but then jumping back into Black Ops, enabling 120, it's a game changer, and presumably gives you an advantage online as you'll be able to react quicker. Now Digital Foundry did find that the Xbox gets between 100 and 120 FPS, and there were some issues initially with the PS5 version, but it seems to be fixed now, and while the graphics are taken down a notch, we're finally getting that PC gaming experience on a console. Remember though that you will need a TV that supports variable refresh rates and 120Hz, and most currently don't, so that is something to bear in mind. So we're getting better graphics, options for higher frame rates, we have the new controller, but the other big PS5 upgrade is with the load times. As we're now getting an SSD, which is replacing the ancient hard drive in the older consoles, everything is just so much faster. For example, from the home screen, loading up Black Ops and resuming my campaign takes 1 minute 33 seconds on the PS4 Pro versus just 40 seconds on the PS5. And older PS4 games get a huge speed boost as well. Detroit Become Human takes nearly 2 minutes to load into my save game on the PS4 versus just 1 minute and 3 seconds on the PS5, so almost half the time. Now to be fair, it was a similar experience on the new Xbox, and actually that went a step further with Quick Resume, which would literally pause up to a dozen games that you could jump between in about 15 seconds. Whereas on the PS5, while we have this new Switcher menu, and it's still pretty quick, it always puts me back on the main menu in games, as if it needs to reload them, rather than putting me straight back into my port gameplay on the Series X. But still, faster loading times are a big deal, and it'll only become more important as developers optimize their new exclusive next-gen games to take advantage of the SSD, which could actually fundamentally change gameplay. The downside though, as I mentioned earlier, is we don't have a ton of storage, and consider Black Ops takes up about 150 gigs, although that is exceptionally big. You will be able to expand it at some point, but right now there aren't any official PS5 compatible SSDs that you can buy. Now speaking of actually buying the PS5, one thing I would recommend is to avoid the digital edition because even though I'm not actually that bothered about say playing UHD Blu-ray movies, being able to buy, sell and trade physical copies of games is pretty important to me and means that you're not limited to just digital store prices. So there's a lot to get excited about with the PS5 but it doesn't mean everyone should rush out and buy one. Because once you've unboxed it, set it up and maybe even hugged it, don't ask, and then spent a couple of days playing Spider-Man, Black Ops, maybe a bit of Valhalla, NBA 2K or Little Big Planet, you quickly realise that while everything looks and plays a little bit better, there isn't really much next gen. To be fair, that is always the case at launch. It's mostly just shinier versions of cross-gen games that you can also play on your current PS4 or Xbox. But I did find myself pretty quickly flicking through the PlayStation Store looking to spend silly amounts of money on any kind of new experience or shiny next gen version of a game. So, ordinarily I'd say you're better off waiting a few months, you know, more games, maybe a bundle deal, but actually, just like the Xbox Series X, because it's also the best way to play all your current PS4 games with faster load times and better frame rates, the truth is, even without a ton of next-gen games right now, I'd still highly recommend upgrading. And if not for the games, then just the fact that I no longer have to put up with the Category 5 hurricane that is my PS4 Pro. Sitting on this sofa, which is just a few feet from the PS5, I can't hear it at all, which is just a night and day difference from the PS4. And also, while it is a big boy of a console, and half of most people's reviews so far seem to just be focusing on the size of it, I don't really think it's that big of a deal, and personally I love the slightly futuristic look of it, even if it does look like the big brother of my Orbi router. Now, the last question I promise we're nearly finished is should you buy the PS5 or the Xbox? And it's a tricky one, although I'm sure you guys would agree it all comes down to the games, which exclusives are you know, more important to you, and also which console your friends play on, because if everyone's you know, playing Xbox Live, then you've got a PlayStation, then you'll be Billy No Mates. 
Now, in favor of the Xbox, it is a little bit more powerful than the PS5, although it won't make a huge amount of difference in real life. You're probably going to get closer to that sort of 120 FPS in games that support it, whereas the PS5 may struggle a tiny bit. But I don't think that's really a good enough reason to go for one or the other. Of course, the price is the same, £450 or $500. But one reason you may want to go to Team Green is you do get an extra couple of hundred gigs of storage, which isn't a massive deal for some people, but if you've got slow internet and you don't want to keep re-downloading all your games, then that will come in handy. And also, the fact that if I spin this round, you can already buy the Seagate expansion card. This is one terabyte. It does cost almost as much as the Series S by itself, but you do have that option. Also, if you are thinking about playing Blu-rays, 4K Blu-rays, the Xbox actually does support uh, Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos, whereas right now, at least, for some reason, the PS5 doesn't. And also, the quick resume feature is quite nice and means you can jump into your games a little bit quicker than you can on the PlayStation. Now, in favor of the PS5, I think this is a real selling point, the DualSense 5 controller. I do love the Xbox controller, but the you know improved haptics, the rumble, the touchpad, just a few extra little bells and whistles you get with this do give you a slightly more immersive experience. Also, if you've got a pair of the compatible headphones, you can get 3D spatial sound with the PS5. I haven't actually tried that out myself, but that could be quite a cool extra. It does kind of occur to me as I'm listing the pros and cons for each that I think the Xbox does offer a little bit more uh, bang for your buck, if you will. But personally, I think the exclusives on the PS5 are more exciting. And also the exclusives on the Xbox will also be coming to PC. So if you've got a gaming PC, then you don't really need the Xbox as much. So personally, I think I would go with the PS5. But really, you can't go wrong with any of them. But what about you? Which one would you go for? Let me know in the comments below, or maybe it's none of the above and you're just gonna wait and see. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I do hope you enjoyed this video, and if you want to see more from me, don't forget to hit that little subscribe button below, and I'll catch you next time right here on the Tech Chat.